Hello, and welcome back to my channel. My name is Derek Main, and welcome to Read the World. I review translated literature, and today I am excited to review Tentacle by Rita Indiana, translated by Aiki Obala Obas from And Other Stories. This was the winner of the grand prize of the Association of Caribbean Writers. It is a Dominican Republic novel, a novel set there, and also, um, I believe, a Dominican a writer for the Dominican Republic. It came onto my radar uh, because of the BTBAs, the Best Translated Book Award. So this is one of the 25 that was on the long list. It was one of the three that I hadn't read where I read the description and immediately knew I wanted to check out and see. I'm not going to hold it up the whole time because hopefully my editing skills have improved enough to put it right there. Well, Tentacle. This book was fascinating, awesome, crazy, batshit, wild, prescience, very smart, brave, experimental. Okay, so I just threw a lot at you. But the book throws a lot at you in a fairly slim, you know, 130 pages. It's a genre book, so it is science fiction. I don't read a lot of science fiction. I think you know I, I typically read literary fiction, but one, but one of the things that I love about where contemporary literature is, is that genre fiction is starting to really meld into our literary fiction, which was always a terrible, terrible title. I never liked that term. But this is both, right? But it pulls its its ethos from science fiction. And like a lot of great science fiction, even having not read it, I can understand this, it deals with themes that are of the right now. Themes that are actually, frankly, very critical. In particular, Tentacle, I would say the primary theme is climate change, which I believe is the uh, biggest issue we face. You could argue or quibble with wealth inequality being the other. Uh, however, I think they're so intertwined, and I'm going to go with climate change. So any, anyway, that tentacle is dealing with that issue, but it's dealing with so much more. As I said, it's throwing a ton at you. And so our main character, actually, Akayal de Figueroa, is a woman when we start our story. But there's also a lot of element of queer culture, queer politics, possibly the future of where some of that lies, transgender politics in particular, that oddly, they're not difficult to talk about politically. I mean, not for me, because I, I hope to have no prejudices and whatever I find that I do, which as a heterosexual white middle class man, I certainly do find myself accidentally having them. I try to learn and study and, you know, talk to people to lose them. But it's actually difficult to talk about because it plays such a large plot role in this. So, there's not much else to say that you can say without kind of giving away a bit of the fun of the puzzle, but just to say that Beyond climate change, I would say the next very big thematic element we'll call sexual politics, identity, we'll call it that. The thing the book does best, very unique, is how it deals with time, and in particular time travel, or a type of time travel. It deals with it in a way that I have never read any other book. I don't think it's a trope of science fiction. Admittedly, as I said up front, I don't read a lot of it, but I don't believe it is. I believe that this is novel, and I quite enjoyed that. I think that one of the things that you can say about Tentacle, or I can say confidently, is that I am more interested in literature that tries something experiments and plays with its own food, so to speak, 
and then maybe doesn't hit 10 out of 10 as opposed to something that is technically so proficient but leaves you cold is kind of distant work I personally, there are some novels out right now, actually, quite a few of them actually coming from some Scandinavian countries by men, that I am not particularly interested in, though I know many people are, and I don't begrudge people that. And maybe in 15, 20 years, I will be interested, or five, or whatever. I mean, just because right this second I'm not doesn't mean I won't. And it doesn't mean it's not good work. But I'm more interested in diversity not just of the people writing it but diversity of ideas and tentacle is diverse with ideas and concepts and it does not always hit it does not always work not every single game that it sort of plays not every single alley that it goes down is perfect but it grows on you as you're reading it. And it's a slim volume. I mean, it's 130 pages. So it's not that you're lost in it. It's just that there are parts that you're kind of like, ah, oh, that's a reach for something that's not quite there. It's not fully developed. But again, we're throwing a ton of things in a very slim volume. So it almost feels like, why even mention this? Well, I mention this to say that Tentacle is... Part of the beauty of this book and part of what makes it so fascinating, interesting, is, is in where it, the fact that it's trying, right? And the fact that it feels like such a new and interesting type of literature. Not that nothing of like this has ever been done. It certainly has. And as I said, it's a genre element. But it really sort of tosses the kitchen sink of ideas at you in a compact space and it does so very very well and so I, I want to sort of celebrate the work and celebrate the, an achievement because it feels like a massive achievement to be such a thin volume and also to be so plot driven I, I mean it really is A to B to C I mean because of the time travel element there's lots of that going on and you do have to sort of figure out where you're at at times and get your bearings but it is I think like a lot of science fiction I mean it's a fairly straightforward in terms of you know here is the crisis here is how the crisis is going to be solved here is the futuristic kind of elements that are there and you know then there's the action the ultimate res resolution so for it to have such a very good story that is propelling forward and still be packing in all of those really critical modern ideas, I think is really impressive. So I've got a couple of, as always, sections highlighted. Let's start with page 47. I'm obsessed, of course, with literature, so this had a really cool section that I thought of. As soon as I read it, I thought, well, this is the literature of the future, if, if not of now. Acolyde sent Eric a picture of a monkey. Eric sent back a photo of the Titanic. Acolyde responded with a photo of the Titanic at the bottom of the sea and a photo of a rainbow. After a minute of more photos, Acolyde had sent him one of Pancho Villa, one of Matias Mella, another of Mama Tingo, and one of a postcard of a sunset on the beach from back when the sea reflected the sky and wasn't just contaminated chocolate. The monkey was still the most well-known call for help. Even the police knew what it meant. Eric got the message. Acolyde was in Via Mella, in deeper than the Titanic. She had the sea creature with her, and she would return it to him in exchange for Rainbow Bright. She'd wait for him around the Mama Tingo metro station after dark. So you have to read the book to know what like eight of those references are. But I like how the communication method is through emojis. You know, that's really creative. It is exactly, I can attest from having kids the age that I have, that that's how they communicate, through memes and emojis. And since I'm obsessed with literature, words, communication, I like that that was an element there. Page 100, let's dive right in with climate change. This to me is about hope and hopelessness and sort of 
tossing and turning between the two as if you're up all night. I know this is how I feel about climate change. It's very odd to have, you know, a six-year-old and a nine-year-old in this world and wonder and know that, you know, my generation, though hopefully not done, I mean, we're a bit older, you know, and, and um, didn't, didn't fix it, weren't able to weren't able to make much progress, frankly. Uh, and and at times you're hopeful for the next generation, and at times you feel a little hopeless. You feel like the systems, particularly uh, market-based systems like capitalism, are just set up to have us fail on this, on this part. So anyway, 100, uh, I thought was a really nice deconstruction of that hope and hopelessness. She gave windsurfing lessons during the day. At night, she wrote letters and proposals trying to get international organizations to carry out preliminary investigations on which she'd be able to base her conservation project. She relied on scientific articles that became increasingly more pessimistic about the reefs in the Caribbean, illustrated with photographs that showed white patches gaining more and more territory on the hard but fragile coral. Refusing to use medication, she managed her moods on her own. She'd dive into deep depressions, shutting herself up in her studio and eating only Chef Boyardee straight from the can, convinced the end of the world was irreversible and widespread ignorance would continue to prevent her from saving the ocean. And so I like that two parts. You know, one, you know, spending the day writing all those international organizations, tearing over evidence and photographs, try to get someone to listen, but then also needing to shut yourself in because you're depressed and eat Chef Boyardee for days at a time, convinced that nothing will ever change. And I think that if you are a feeling, empathetic human being that cares about anything, um, you probably go through both stages, depending on where you're at. And depending on what it is, you know, that you're trying to save. In this case, is the ocean. Page nine, this is the very second paragraph, I believe, and I just, yeah, it's the second paragraph, and I am just going to I'm going to finish off my review of Tentacle by just reading the second paragraph because it will give you a sense 100% of whether you are in or you are not. So before I do that, I'm going to say my quick sort of what's going on with the channel. Uh, so obviously today we got Tentacle. On Sunday, last Sunday night, I did a live, uh, I guess, video blog, video chat uh, conversation with Michael from Knowledge Lost, uh, also from, he's from the podcast Lost in Translations, and we did it on book collecting. And I specifically talked about the new documentary called Booksellers, about uh, selling rare and antique books. He talked about um, a book about building your library, and we talked about our own habits when it comes to book collecting. I'm going to link to that video. Uh, I hope, actually, I think we might do another couple of these series while we're all sort of at home and stuck here. And hopefully, I mean, it looks like enough people kind of got, were interested in, in it. So probably do that. And, and that helps me because I'm reading a mammoth right now. And one that I'm sure you all know, but this is George Perec's Life's a User Manual, uh, translated from the French by David Bellows from Godine. And uh, this is just, I, I actually heard Tom Roberge talking about it on the 3% podcast at the very end. He said his store, Riff Raff Books, had two copies and he bought one of the two copies and started to read it and was intrigued because it had an element of a puzzle to it. And I've known about this book forever, but I've never even looked into what it really was. I just knew it was a masterpiece or considered a masterpiece. Well, Chad Post also on that podcast just kind of mentioned, oh, I love this book. Something just struck with me. We said one of two copies, and I thought, you know what? Now would be a good time to really dig into a big one, and I love puzzles. So I am 100 pages in, and I'm entranced already. I can tell how much I'm going to love this. But it's huge. So uh, I did finish one more book uh, in between those, which was The Arid Sky. I do not have... It's by Emilio Montaigne, and it's from Restless Books, but I do not have the translator right. It might be Thomas Bernard. That might be right. Okay. I'm going to put it up right there. But anyway, uh, I don't have the book in front of me. And I'm doing that as like a buddy read with um, 
P.G. Smith, Michael Egan, Damian Keller, I think is waiting on his copy, Dorian Stuber, I probably pronounced a bunch of their names wrong and missed some people, but on Twitter. And we're gonna do like a Zoom thing where we kinda talk about it. I don't know if that's gonna be recorded in like part of YouTube or anything, or if we're just gonna do that for fun, but eventually I will talk to, about that book. But I wanna talk with them first, since we did it as a buddy read before I, you know, jump the gun on everybody and do a review. So um, anyway, yeah, that's kind of like where my content's at for now. Uh, I'm going to finish off with the second paragraph of Tentacle, which if you like this, what I'm about to read, then you are going to dig this book. Recognizing the virus in the black man, the security mechanism in the tower releases a lethal gas and simultaneously informs the neighbors, who will now avoid the building's entrance until the automatic collectors patrolling the streets and avenues pick up the body and disintegrate it. Acolyte waits until the man stops moving to disconnect and return to cleaning the window panes, encrusted on a daily basis with sticky soot. As she smears the windows with Windex, she sees a collector across the street hunt down another illegal, a woman who tries to hide behind a dumpster unsuccessfully. The machine picks her up with its mechanized arm and deposits her in its main container with all the diligence of a gluttonous child picking up dirty candy from the floor. A few blocks up, two other collectors work ceaselessly. From this distance, Alkalide cannot make out the men they're chasing. The yellow machines look like bulldozers at a construction site. Thank you very much as always for watching. Be good to folks.